In May 1994, in the heart of London, the Queen Mother was invited to unveil a statue. The statue had been erected as a memorial to Arthur Harris, who led the Royal Air Force's Bomber Command in World War II. But of the many thousands present, some were not so enthusiastic about a memorial to Bomber Harris. As the Queen Mother tried to deliver her speech, there were cries from the crowd that Harris was a murderer. mother was visibly upset by the jury. The crowd was protesting that Harris had been responsible for the slaughter of thousands of innocent lives during the massive bombing raids on the German cities, and in particular, the bombing of Dresden. Despite the protests, the unveiling went ahead. His mission, and I quote, was to crush the morale of the German civilian population. What he did was to kill 600,000 or so. Meanwhile, in Dresden on the same day, a simple service was held to remember the many thousands that had died in the raids. Dresden, in Saxony, was one of Germany's most historic cities dating back to the early 13th century. It had always been admired as being one of the most beautiful cities in the world with its historic art collections and galleries, theatres, cultural buildings and palaces. The magnificent Semper opera had staged many of the world's operatic premieres by Strauss and Wagner. Huge palatial edifices were constructed, the Frauenkirche, the Zwinger, the Moritzberg and Pilnitz castles and the Opera House. Along with Europe's oldest and most famous porcelain works in nearby, Meissen. Over the following centuries, visitors to Dresden were witness to magnificent and treasured art collections by such renowned artists as Canaletto, Monet, Botticelli, Raphael, Rembrandt, Renoir, Rubens, Van Gogh and Toulouse-Lautrec, to name but a few. 
The Zwinger had often been praised by many a visitor for the outstanding beauty of its Baroque architecture and for the splendid exhibits and treasures housed in its wings. It housed one of the world's finest collections of porcelain, stoneware and pottery. There was also a rich collection of scientific instruments and clocks, some dating back as far as the 13th century. There were beautiful art collections and also one of the world's most comprehensive zoological museums. The front of the gateway is topped by the Royal Crown of Poland. Along with the emblems of the Saxon-Polish dynasty of Augustus the Strong, who commissioned the building of the Swinger as a celebration of his power at that time. The Theaterplatz was one of Germany's finest squares, at the center of which stood the statue of King John. There has never been any mystery, although there has been some mystification, about why the British Royal Air Force bombed and almost totally crushed this beautiful city of Dresden at the end of World War II. By the February of 1945, however, there had been a number of bombing raids against oil targets in eastern Germany, and these had been made without unsustainable losses. Nearly 1,000 Allied bombers had flown deep into the heartland of Germany and raided railway and oil installations. The aim was to cut the supply of oil to Germany's retreating forces and to destroy any remaining links of communication. They created an outstanding amount of damage and in doing so inevitably killed many thousands of the civilian population. Furthermore, the successful Russian offensive which had begun in mid-January of the same year had created a new military situation. As the Russians advanced through Silesia, it became apparent that air attacks on the East German cities which confronted them might be of powerful assistance to the Soviet drive. The Russian army, along with their tactical air forces, were already advancing towards Berlin. But there was a fear that Germany could bring up a rearguard action from the east, from such cities as Dresden and Leipzig and Chemnitz. It was decided that a severe blitz on these cities would not only cause a great deal of confusion for German forces, but would also block any movement of troops. Furthermore, if attacks were launched on those cities, the disorganization and havoc which would be created would be much greater because their population had been swollen by the many thousands of refugees. A great many of these had moved to Dresden from other German cities, which had already been bombed but a great many more had fled there to escape being in the path of the Russian advance. Many of Germany's cities had already experienced a blitz or bombing raid. Cologne, a city that once had a population of 800,000 civilians, had been reduced by the Royal Air Force to a city of rubble which now only housed 40,000. A population which had suffered carnage on an unprecedented scale and ferocity. Cologne had been the first city to experience the might of Bomber Harris's new directive to his air force. The massive bombing power of no less than 1,000 aircraft hitting the same target in less than 90 minutes. It was also the first air raid by Britain that did not target the industrial areas, but instead targeted the very heart of the city. 
And in Cologne's case, this heart was the residential area housing the civilian population. What had once been Germany's fourth largest city was now no more than a sea of rubble. This once great thriving city, which proudly stood as a center of industrial power, had been reduced to a heap of twisted iron and broken bricks. The bombers had destroyed the city's bridges, crushed the railways and marshalling yards, shattered the city's many churches, and demolished the city's homes and factories. In some areas, the fallen masonry and debris was so deep that the streets below were completely hidden. All that remained of Cologne was a mass of gutted, roofless shells, beneath which lived a handful of the original population. This was the catastrophic effect that the Royal Air Force's Mama Command could have on a city, to literally remove it from the map in one night. This was the power of terror bombing. And this is what the Russian commanders wanted to happen to Dresden. At the Allied conference at Yalta, the Russians requested the Allied cooperation in the mass bombing of all communications in Germany to prevent any reinforcement of the German Eastern Front. They wanted these attacks within an agreed bomb line to keep the British and American air forces away from any territory they might soon occupy. In particular, they requested attacks on Berlin, Leipzig and Dresden all within the agreed Anglo-American air operations. Berlin was the first city. On the 3rd of February, 1945, nearly 1,000 B-17 bombers of the United States 8th Air Force made a massive raid on the railways and government targets in Berlin. Another 400 bombers attacked the railways and oil installations in Magdeburg. The result was catastrophic for the Germans. The communications and railway networks were smashed beyond recognition. Large areas of industrial and residential buildings were flattened. Any remaining transportation link for the German army was completely eradicated. An estimated 25,000 of the civilian population were killed and tens of thousands more were homeless. The city of Dresden was to be next. Following a few days of bad weather, on the 13th of February, Bomber Command was ready for the assault on the unsuspecting German city. As the citizens of Dresden went about their daily business, the first of the bombers took off. The plan was to put a first wave of aircraft over the target to carpet the area with incendiary bombs. These would not only serve as a marker for the target, lighting up the night sky for the rest of the bombers, but they would also set the city ablaze. Once the city's rescue services and firefighters had been put into action, a second wave of bombers was to follow, catching them in the open. The second wave not only carried a much heavier bomb than the blast bombs, which would spread the fires, but even more incendiary bombs to fuel them. This was a new directive of Bomber Command, following the terrible raid inflicted on Hamburg, where they found the devastation caused by burning the city was even more effective 
and just blasting it. The detonation of the exploding bombs and the peals of thunder and the crackling of flames formed a veritable inferno, which became an overwhelming enemy for the city. In the resulting and infamous Hamburg firestorm stirred up by the heavy winds, the fire became a furnace and the city was engulfed in flames within an hour. 40,000 people had been killed and almost 900,000 people had lost their homes. After a 10-hour flight, the first wave of bombers approached Dresden. The city below was ill-prepared for its fate. The resulting fires could be seen from a distance of 80 kilometers away. Werner Rachel was a young boy living in Dresden at the time of the raid. It was a night he will never forget. I would like to add a small attack had it schon im winter before. I remember that in the winter before, in 1944, there had been a small air raid around the railway station. Da war man schon mal ein bisschen munter geworden, aber alle anderen. When this attack started, people didn't believe it was happening. They couldn't understand what was going on. It had been a beautiful day. I remember how warm it was. When we heard the air raid sirens, we had been standing in the courtyard without our jackets. That's how warm it was. Shrove Tuesday, 1945. Even then, it wasn't until we actually saw the bombers in the air that we hurried to the shelters. And then, within minutes, it happened. The doors banged, the windows cracked, and things fell down all around us. We were all very frightened. We were very frightened. I remember that I didn't want to show my fear. I was trying to show that I was a brave and fearless young man. So I remember biting into my pillow to hide just how afraid I really was. The first attack lasted about 20 minutes. And believe me, this seemed like an eternity. When we heard the all-clear siren telling us the raid was over, we were exhausted, and you cannot imagine how relieved we were. It was still possible for us to walk up the staircase from our basement shelter, and I remember going to a window to look out into the street. Oh, beautiful city, Dresden was on fire. We all started to cry. Well, we went back to bed. 
Despite Spite the horrible thing we had just experienced, we were glad it was over. And being so tired, I fell asleep straight away. Before long, we were again awoken by the sound of sirens. Everybody rushed back to the shelter and sat there whilst we went through the same experience all over again. I could hear the bombs dropping and I remember that all we cared about was that we would survive this night. A second wave of bombers had arrived at the target, which was already a mass of flame against the night sky. Peter Grohman reports his experience. My name is Peter Grohman. My relatives lived in Dresden, and during the war we had come here as refugees from Breslau. We stayed with our relatives. I was only a small boy at the time, but I remember the night of the Blitz very well. I was sitting in the basement air raid shelter with my mother and my brother when the bombers arrived. I will never forget it as long as I live. After such a long time, one tries to repress such horrific memories and forget about your experiences in the war, but you can't. After the war, we had moved to West Germany, and now that I am back in Dresden, all of those memories of that terrible night have come flooding back. We were in the basement when our house took a direct hit from the bombers. There were lots of us in the shelter. Most of them were women and children, as most of the men of the family were away fighting at the front. My uncle, I remember, was so scared, he actually started to have a breakdown. He was worried that we had been trapped and wouldn't get out alive. Well, we finally did get out of the shelter, helped by rescue workers, and I remember we had to get into cars provided by the Red Cross. All of the children were blindfolded as we were brought out. I sat in this car and we were taken away. Well, I took off my blindfold, and that's when I saw the horrifying pictures of the city. It was a scene of devastation. The city had gone. In its place was a pile of rubble and burning buildings. People were wandering around aimlessly, lost and bewildered. Rescue workers fought to free trapped survivors in the shelters below. The firefighting crews couldn't cope with the overwhelming amount of burning buildings. This once proud and beautiful city was now thick with flames and smoke. in the shelters under the crushing weight of the fallen masonry. Many more were trapped, but the rescue workers couldn't reach all of them in time to save them, and hundreds of people perished from asphyxiation. Bodies lay everywhere amongst the debris. The city's mortuaries were full. Makeshift areas were established in whatever buildings remained. Dresden was now a city of the dead. But the ordeal of Dresden was by no means over. When my relatives wanted after these events not to take responsibility for my life. 
After this night, my relatives, who I was staying with, no longer wanted to be responsible for my well-being. They knew it was no longer safe in Dresden and decided I would be safer leaving and going back to my parents. I left my relatives behind and started to walk through the city. It was a slow process. Everything was destroyed and the roads were blocked. The dead and wounded lay everywhere. Bodies piled high on top of each other. I suddenly felt fear for my relatives, leaving them behind. So I turned around and made my way back to their house. No sooner had I arrived back at their front door when I heard the sound once again. I could hear the engines of the bombers. Once again, there were British or American bombers in the sky. On the 14th of February, 311 American bombers attacked the city once. Dresden received its third blow in 14 hours. Some aimers found it difficult to see the target. The city was covered in a layer of smoke and dust. Once again, thousands of tons of bombs rained down on the already broken city. Below, the already exhausted and dazed citizens rushed to the comparative safety of the shelters, at least those shelters that still remained.
As we drove out of the city, we could see that everything we knew was gone. There was nothing left. All of the buildings had gone. All of them. As we left the city, we left behind a city on fire. Last memories I have of that time when we left Dresden was a picture of flames, ruins, rubble. We knew we couldn't return. There was nowhere for us to live, no shelter. We eventually ended up in the spa town of Harta. My name is Dr. Karl Ludwig Hoch. I am a priest in Dresden. I have always had a great affinity for the city of Dresden. I was born here, and Dresden is the only place I have ever worked as a priest. I am retired now. In the heart of our city was a most impressive landmark, the Frauenkirche. It had always been important to me and to my family for many generations. My ancestors were confirmed and christened there. Furthermore, the church was of great importance to the city as it was the headquarters of the church in its battle against Hitler. During the Blitz in 1945, the Frauenkirche was hit and collapsed. This, for me, marked the final destruction of Dresden. From my parents' house, we could see over the whole of the city. When the fire started, it caused the sky to go black, and this lasted for about two days. On the second day, I was looking out of the window over the burning Dresden, when all of a sudden the black clouds over the Frauenkirche just lifted and disappeared. I could see the big dome. It was a truly amazing sight. The Frauenkirche was still standing, even though it was completely surrounded by flames. I said to my mother that it can't be as bad as that. At least the Frauenkirche has survived the fire. I took my camera and took a picture of the dome. I am so glad I did this, as this was the last time we would see it again. The Frauenkirche collapsed just a few hours later. This was the moment when the people of Dresden grasped just how bad the catastrophe was. However, we always knew that it was the Germans who had started the bombing attacks. My mother always told us that the destruction of the Jewish synagogue was the beginning of the destruction of Dresden. In 1938, the Nazis had burned Dresden synagogue, and my mother knew then that soon all the other churches would also be destroyed. It was Britain's Royal Air Force, however, that was to carry out his mother's premonition. But it wasn't only the churches they destroyed in Dresden. They destroyed the complete city. More people died in Dresden than in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Can such destruction be justified? And furthermore, was it right to erect a memorial to the very man that gave the orders for such destruction? Group Captain Ken Bachelor, now deceased, served with Arthur Harris, and it was largely due to his efforts that the statue was erected. But the losses were, I think the Germans lost something like 500,000 or something through Allied bombing raids. But you see, when you, you could make invidious comparisons, because I've been three times to Warsaw, and uh, when the cannon uh, of come to cathedral protested about the, the statue being unveiled by the Queen Mother, uh, after a rumpus had been started by the mayor of Dresden only last year, after we were talking about the project for two and a half years, I reminded the worthy canon that uh, in Warsaw, 1944, the Germans had, in the General Borkomorski's uprising, had destroyed, killed 250,000 of the Warsaw city population. And 
our great friend, and great, who was only died just a month ago, Leonard Cheshire, wrote an extremely good letter in the Daily Mail on the 20th of May, pointing out that while we were bombing Germany, Hitler was engaged in the final solution. And that was as he wrote. And he'd said things like that before, the extermination of 20 million innocents at the rate of 10,000 a day. So it is possible to make invidious comparisons, but we've all been pointed out post-war. Try and keep the thing in perspective. We don't bear present animosity to uh, the German population, or do we, are we trying to open old wounds? And just think of what had gone in on in Europe, of how those of those have been deported and uh, I think the French lost about two million, the Poles certainly lost about six million. Though. War is a horror, and we're the very people who don't want to see another one. It ill becomes a nation to complain about uh, the statute of Obama Harris when he, as much as anyone, enabled the, the Germans to be freed from the Nazi regime. The survivors of the Blitz tried as best they could to get the city's main supplies working again. Not only had the city lost the majority of its famed buildings, but out of a total of 220,000 homes in the city, 75,000 were completely destroyed, and a further 11,500 were damaged beyond repair. The railways and transportation systems were wrecked, and thousands of people were homeless and living in whatever makeshift shelter they could find. These were sad and desperate times for the people of Dresden. Post-war, they ended up on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, and life became a constant struggle. However, although they had lost a great part of their life during the Blitz, the people of Dresden never lost their character or the will to bring the city back to life again. I went back to Dresden a short time after I had left, and all I could see were ruins. Kilometer after kilometer was flattened. You couldn't even walk through the streets properly because there was so much rubble. It was only later that the people started to dig out little pathways. There was not one stone on top of another anymore. Most of the famous and important buildings were damaged. Many of them destroyed completely. The castle was in a very bad way. In fact, up until just a few years ago, you could still see the damage that was caused to the castle. The Zwinger was very badly damaged, but luckily restoration started on this very quickly. The occupying forces were responsible for this restoration as they gave orders that it should be started immediately the war ended. I am personally very grateful for this. It has to be said that they did, once the war had ended, start to restore the buildings, and those that weren't started, the stones were rescued and preserved to keep what was left. The opera house was also very badly damaged. This was the favorite building for the people of Dresden. Immediately after the war, people from all over started to donate money for its restoration. Unfortunately, it was not enough to rebuild it, but enough was raised to save all the stones and what was left to prevent any further damage. 
We had to wait many years for the opera to be rebuilt. But the fact is that the opera house did finally get restored, along with its rehearsal stages. The restoration was completed through the hard work of many, many people, the artisans, the artists, the craftsmen. This is something that the people of Dresden can now be very proud of. The Aufbau der Stadt selbst wurde in den späteren Jahren the first reconstruction plan was drawn up on the 7th of January 1946. This was a relatively conservative plan. After the FRG was founded, they introduced a reconstruction law which didn't come into force until the 6th of September in 1950. The law stated that all of the destroyed areas of the city were to come under their jurisdiction, which eliminated any influence at all from the private sector. This was to prove disastrous for the planning of the new city. Another factor involving the reconstruction plans was that the new political policies did not have any bearing on Dresden's pre-war policies. It was a constant battle, but we did manage to save our old standard of town planning and also saved the theater square. The FRG regime wanted all historic sites, including the square, to become new social centers. That had the effect that had the effect if this had happened, we would have lost our art gallery and the castle all the way up to the tower. The Semper Opera would also have been replaced by a new building. Ja, der Wiederaufbau der der Semper Oper hat ja relativ lange auf sich warten lassen, weil diese it took a very long time for the construction work to get underway on the Semper Opera House. There were, of course, a great many other important works to begin on the destroyed city of Dresden. The most important was to clear away the debris and the rubble and to build houses for all those that had lost theirs during the Blitz. This was a most interesting time for us architects. You could see how the ruined city got out of its misery by reclaiming its own destroyed materials and using them to build the new city. The bricks of the destroyed houses were ground down and made into cement, which was used to build the new houses. And this was a very creative time for us. There were no regulations on style of architecture, so we were allowed to create our own ideas. However, this was short-lived, as unfortunately, our new concepts and ideas were soon lost through the bureaucracy of the new government. In 1967, there was a competition for the renovation of the Opera House, and architects from East Germany were all asked to present their ideas. Well, we came second and were asked to carry out further studies on the project. At the end of the competition, we had, however, presented a summary, which was used as the government's directive on the reconstruction. The directive stated that the exterior of the Opera House should remain unchanged. The interior, however, should be rebuilt. There were plans for a new auditorium with modern, comfortable seating and a good all-round view. It should retain the, the legendary acoustics of the original Semper opera. In 
However, later on it was decided to change the exterior as well, as the building was going to be extended. The original 19th century building was not going to be large enough to function as a modern theater. Accordingly, the directive stated that the Semper opera should be extended underneath its own original roof design. There were two important elements, both of which contradicted each other, the acoustics and the view. The fact that we could not manage to create good acoustics in the new room. We had carried out a series of tests and every time we found that it would be impossible to create the necessary acoustics in a room which provided the excellent views required under the directive. It was discovered that we could only get the acoustics right by retaining the shapes of the original interior of the Semper opera. The other problem we had was how to adapt the exterior of the opera as the directive was to keep the original structures but to construct them with modern methods. This was just not possible. We continued our studies for many years trying to find ways around the problem without success. In 1971, however, we were given new directives. At this time, residential housing was given priority and there were no extra funds available for cultural buildings. Of course, whilst working on housing projects, we still spent some of our own time coming up with new ideas for the opera. When we finally went back to working on the Semper opera plans, officially in 1974, we had our own ideas as to how it could be done. Different ideas from the original directive. We wanted to keep the Semper building as it was, apart from just a few minor changes to the stage area. All of the other functions which were necessary for a modern theater should be housed in a completely separate building, and this is what we built. The other building was constructed in a modern way, and we made sure that the new building only touched the historic original on two small points where they are both connected by bridges. The government had to accept that the good acoustics could only be achieved by retaining the old designs of the Semper opera. And as we explained, hearing a performance was more important in opera than seeing it. The government department had to concede to this point and accept these decisive arguments. The construction work itself took seven years, which may seem a very long time, but if you consider all of the shapes which had to be duplicated from the original construction, and by copying exactly the stones that remained, it was not that long a time. If you visit Dresden today, it would be hard to imagine how the city looked in those post-war times. Remarkable works have been carried out by thousands of craftsmen, restoring the city to its pre-war glory and splendor. Even now the work is not complete. There are many buildings which are still undergoing painstaking renovation and the towers of the cranes and scaffolding still dominate the skyline. We are very grateful that it was possible to preserve all of the ruins and keep them. And now that the wall has come down, we can rebuild the city. We had already done a significant amount of work before that. The Zwinger, the Opera House and the Castle there had been a great deal of preparation works already carried out in these buildings. So when the wall did come down, much of the work had been done. So the construction was much simpler and could be rebuilt much more quickly. 
The Tashkent Barrack Palace was built in less than 18 months. The Italian village was also quickly restored, and at the moment, the Frauenkirche is undergoing restoration. You must realize, however, that 60% of the city's original buildings are still missing. We still don't have a city center. We still have to rebuild the area around the Frauenkirche and the castle on the old parcella. So we retain the right surroundings for our historic monuments using the original structure. We had moved away to West Germany in the 1950s, but I always kept in touch with my friends and relatives and the people of Dresden. I was told about all of the reconstruction work going on, especially on the great buildings, such as the Semper Opera. Every time I visited, my relatives would proudly show me around the city, pointing out the renovation. It was only when you had seen the devastation and the destruction that you appreciated just how much was going on. New blocks of flats, etc. And each time I came back, I noticed how much livelier the city was becoming. It may be many years before Dresden is once again the beautiful city it was when it was painted by Canaletto. But the ceaseless will to preserve their heritage by the people of Dresden has ensured that it is once again one of the jewels of Europe. I think in today's modern times, it is difficult to comprehend and come to terms with all the misery which has been caused in this world. I use literature and satire to help me. In my work as a comedian, I try to look at life from a different angle and try to paint a better picture. We all have to learn to laugh again. Laughing about our mistakes and our weaknesses makes us all stronger. Das stärker ist.